Welcome to HDB Agronomy Week 2020. The live stream session will start shortly. Before we begin, we wanted to remind you of a few points of housekeeping. You're all on mute, so don't worry, we can't hear you. The session is scheduled to last between one and one and a half hours, including questions. We want this session to be as interactive as possible, so please post your questions throughout the session using the live Q&A function in the Agronomy Week platform below. We're recording this session, so if you miss anything or would like to watch it again, it will be available on the HDB YouTube channel and HDB website. You can also come back and watch the recordings on the Agronomy Week platform for three months. At the end of the session, we'll provide you with unique basis and Neuroso codes. Don't forget to complete the basis and Neuroso forms using the relevant tabs on the platform. You have two weeks after the live session to register for your points. Join in the conversation online. Follow AHDB underscore cereals and AHDB underscore potatoes on Twitter and use the hashtag Agronomy Week. If you have any issues with the conference platform, there are digital event FAQs in the menu on the left hand side. You can use the help tab to contact the team if you experience any technical problems during the week. We hope that you enjoy Agronomy Week 2020. Thanks for joining us. Your session will now start. Good afternoon. AHDB supports some field labs under the aegis of the organization Innovative Farmers. These labs are initiated by groups of growers who want answers to technical questions that need a bit of research and yet no one seems likely to do it for them. The growers have to be willing to share the results with others. Field labs are a lot of work for all concerned but worth it when they do provide answers. The offer of a field lab was made to attendees at the spot results days this January. Members of Neen Potato Growers expressed an interest. They had good ideas of the technical and scientific people who might help answer their question. One of them was Dr. Ian Gold, Senior Lecturer in Soil Science at the University of Lincoln. He will tell the story of what the field lab did and what answers they now have 11 months later. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Anne, and thank you for the invite. Yes. Um, so as Anne said, yes, I'm uh, Ian Gould. I'm a soil scientist um, at University of Lincoln, increasingly working with coastal soils and saline soils. So um, what I'm going to present to you is uh, the, the journey and the results of our innovative farmers trial with um, lots of different partners. You can see they're all up on the, on the logos, all up on the screen at the moment. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about the trial um, with a short video in the middle so we can actually have a look at it. Um, and uh, it's important to say I'm a, I'm a soil scientist, so I'm only a, a small part, a cog in the, the wider machine of all the partners who did a fantastic job in this trial. So why are we doing this? Why are we looking um, or why are we doing drip irrigation with saline or slightly saline water? I'll come into slightly later. OK, so um, probably don't need to to bang the pots too loud about how how important it is going forwards. Um, the scarcity of water resources we're facing, um, uh, without being a doom monger, we, particularly in the eastern parts of the UK, um, we're reading reports about how much water, fresh water consumption will increase going forwards with lots of different demand from agriculture, from industry and from domestic use. Um, if you add to that um, the increasing sort of levels of, of, of abstraction and use of fresh water, um, we, we have a, a, an extra problem, you could say. Um, what that is, is, is going forwards, we, we're predicted sea level rises. If you have a, a greater sea level rise, that puts more pressure on groundwater than something that we really don't want in our groundwater, which is a saline interface. Um, here's a little schematic, a cut through of a coastal soil or a coastal area. We can see 
um, at below our fresh groundwater, we have a saline interface. Now, as sea levels rise, that saline interface can creep up. And also, the more fresh water we abstract, that saline interface can creep up. So going forwards in coastal areas, we're facing a saltwater lens below the surface lurking there. And it's increasingly starting to rear its ugly head in some areas that we might be wanting to abstract from. It's starting to, um, or it's, it's been for several years, um, very prevalent in drainage ditches um, and water sources um, in coastal areas. So... So as we as we as we move forward, we anticipate this salt water to slowly increase uh, below ground and have less fresh water. Why is that a problem? Well, in coastal areas, and we're talking here, um, Hole Beach Marsh, and um, some of you might be familiar with this area. Beautiful silt soils, I must say. Um, we're in a coastal area where water is pretty scarce already. OK, there's lots of innovation on farm in terms of reservoirs, pumping, how we can manage water on farm. That's a real um, issue at the moment. But if our water resort, if our water sources are increasingly getting slightly more saline, is there an opportunity there to use that slightly saline water? And I'll show you what slightly means in a minute. Slightly saline water to actually uh, use an irrigation source. Um, why do we want to use it as an irrigation source? Well, this is um, quite a lot of uh, potato production here. We need irrigation in for potatoes, not only for crop development, but also for control of, of stuff like common scab. So what we want to know is we're faced with water that's getting increasingly saline. How much of this could we potentially use to irrigate a crop without causing any damage? So, well, if we are going to use it, we've got to address the problems of salinity. So what's, let's look at salinity first up. We know it can impact on yields. We know if time and time again, uh, various studies across the world show that sal salinity can impact on yields. But not a lot has been done in our climate where we, we have an we likely have an overriding flushing over winter, which might remove the salts, okay? Um, we know that different, there are various farmers in the area who are starting to, who have been starting to play about with, with slightly more salinity in their irrigation waters. We know it could cause leaf scorch, the chloride um, applied uh, could cause leaf scorch. So if we are gonna uh, trial it, we need to think of a good delivery technique, which is why we chose drip um, as a method of irrigation in this trial. We also know that salinity can cause problems to soils. You can have structural damage in soils. Um, and the problem with salts as well is they can stick around for a while. If they, if they lodge onto um, what we call cation exchange sites in the soil, they can hang around for a while. Um, but in our climate, we might have flushing over, over winter, so we might be able to, um, to get away with it. We don't know. Furthermore, if you're talking about soils, everyone's talking about soil health now, and we know that salinity is going to impact on whatever's living in that soil. It's going to impact on the soil biological community. But again, not much. It's not really been explored in our area, our part of the world, on our silt soils. So could we have a, a, a field lab um, that could address all this? Could we look at uh, the growth of a Maris Piper crop? Can we measure its quality and its yield? And could we make sure that we haven't done any long term soil damage? And that's what we did in this trial. Uh, how do we do that? Well, we went on to uh, farm. So this is GH Halls. This is working with David Hoyles, who was our, our host farmer as part of um, Neen Growers. So on farm, this is a very, very, it's not really, an, uh, yeah, it's a very simple schematic of the water resources we face on farm. So we've got an irrigation reservoir, which is where uh, they're doing most of the, where they're doing the irrigation from. So they, they fill that up, particularly in times of winter, when they've got a lot of water in the drainage ditches. Currently, irrigation reservoir, when we went in May, um, it had a salinity level of 950 ppm. Now, we'll, we can all, there's, if you've got questions about ppm, we can answer them at the end. But for, all, for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to use ppm as our measure of salinity. So our irrigation reservoir was around 950 ppm. But what else have we got on farm? Well, we have a drainage ditch here. Let's, we, we've stuck some probes in there. We measured the salinity of the drainage ditch. That was coming out at around 6,000 ppm. So... We're already irrigating at 950, but we know there's water on the farm that's that's a lot higher in terms of salinity, 6,000 ppm. We're going to call that's getting what we'd call to the high end of moderately saline. To put those in context, I mean, it's just a value for a lot of a lot of people. But uh, if the irrigation reservoir is 950 ppm, tap water is 380. So it's about half of what we're irrigating with. So what we're currently irrigating with with overhead is double the salinity of tap water, but it's still relatively low. Just to show you, we're only talking slightly saline water in, in all of our trials is because we put the sea here 
Notice the farm is below sea level, which is another reason we're getting some salinity in our water resources. But C is 35,000 ppm. So we're well away from seawater. We are not talking here about irrigating with seawater. Um, we're looking at a, a sort of a blend, if you will. So to do this trial, we took two of our water resources, our irrigation reservoir and our drainage ditch. And we used that as a blending kind of uh, medium to set up a load of treatments. Now, we set up uh, free drip treatments of salinity, 950. That's our reservoir. We doubled it to 2000. We doubled it again to 4000. That was our high treatment. We also did compare it to overhead and to non-irrigated treatment. So we had five plots growing Maris potato on farm this summer with those five different treatments. Low salinity, mid salinity, what we're calling high salinity. But if you compare it to the sea, it's not really high uh, versus overhead versus non-irrigated. I could talk you through the trial, but probably the best thing is to get a bit of a visual experience of it. So we're going to go to a video now, I believe, or shortly. <laughs> Hi, David Hoyles, GH Hoyles, Long Sutton, farming around the wash. Behind me we've got the reservoir um, that we use for storing abstracted water. The drains around this area are mainly saline, we're a couple of metres below sea level and there's only certain times where the ditch water is good enough quality for us to abstract. So we put that water in the reservoir during the winter mainly and then we use it in the spring and summer when needed. As a, as a farmer run group, uh, we're always interested in our crop productivity. For where we are on the Siltland soils, not just for David, for, but for others in the area as well, um, water is a scarce resource and we have to make best use of it. A lot of our growers around here have um, brackish water in their drains. So the water is there, but sometimes it, its salt content is too high. So we were interested in using that water, but we weren't quite sure how far we could take the salinity. So we were looking for the tipping point to look at what water we could use and, and, and what, what level of salinity. And some growers will, you know, maybe on the back of this, will think harder about the water they've got in their drains. So is that suitable to do a job for them in the future? They will still have to put the infrastructure in then, of course, to take it from the drain to irrigate. For the purpose of the trial, we had to purchase IBC containers and the fittings to go into the, the banjo couplings. And basically the Honda pumps are pumping about 30 cube an hour. Um, just trials equipment really, but this was this was what we needed just to facilitate the trial. So we've got we've had three pumps, three IBCs, and three lots of pipe work, which have all coupled up into our pretty standard uh, valves and header main equipment. So downstream from the Honda pump, we come to our control valve. So you, you've got your pressure gauge there. The, the, always the pipe and the, 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 uh, the header main and the lay flat pipe are running around one bar pressure. Water comes through the pipe into the header main. Again, standard equipment. All of this from, from here downstream from the pump is all standard field equipment. So water into the header main through the plastic couplings and in, into the, connected onto the drip tape. This is a standard drip tape about 1.25 litres per metre an hour. Um, the pipe is then buried in the top of the potato row or the, or the onion row and then into the ground. And you can just start to see this has now been running for about three hours and the water's, the water's uh, marking the ridge up and inside the ridge that will be making a lovely job of, uh, of penetrating the ridge and wetting up the crop. My name's Tim Blythe, I'm a director at Soil Moisture Sense and for this project we've been using the Centec 60 centimetre drill and drop tri scan probe for monitoring moisture, temperature and salinity. We have sensors at 10 centimetre increments all the way down the probe and it's installed vertically into the soil. The probe sits flush at the soil surface and when irrigation occurs, we'll pick up the water infiltrating through the soil from the top to the bottom. With the salinity sensors in the probe, it will enable us to actually pick up the salt levels as they go increase or decrease through the profile. For David in the project, he's been using, day to day, been using the probes for scheduling purposes. So he has a repeatable point with a refill line, which enables him to dry the crop out and then wet the crop up. But hopefully with a mixture of temperature, moisture and salinity, 
all of those parameters will enable an informed decision to be made at the end of it as to whether the salinity had an impact on the growth of the crop. Fantastic. So um, hopefully that gave you a really good idea of, of the trial um, and, and the setup. Um, so I'm going to run through the results now. So as, as Tim said, at the end, we hopefully we'll get an idea at the end of the trial at the end of the trial on the impact of this salinity on the crop. So let's look at those uh, results. So I'm going to tell the results in probably three, well, in three sections. We're going to look at crop impacts, we're going to look at soil impacts. And then we're going to look at the overall system economics. How much would it cost us to set up these kind of systems? So this is some uh, really good work that, that John Keir did for us. Um, we're looking across all the treatments, all three different salinity treatments of our drip, but also we did have a comparison with no irrigation and a comparison with boom irrigation. Horn vigor, let's start with this one. Okay, so aside from a couple of, of temporal differences, you see a bit of a, I guess that was in May, you've got a bit of an orange a peak in May, but over time, aside from a few temporal uh, differences, during the season, there was no overall difference in horn vigor between any of the salinity treatments. That was really interesting uh, for us. Um, so we know we can get up to 4,000 ppm, which is four times our normal irrigation water from the reservoir, without an impact on horn vigor. Next up, well, all important yields. Um, very similar story here. We could go all the way up to 4,000 ppm um, without any significant impact in yield. The only plot that showed a, a slight dip in yield, but it wasn't really found to be significant, was our non-irrigated plot. Um, we think what probably uh, kept that ticking over really was um, when we did have rain during the season and we, we, we had the, the soil moisture sense probes uh, monitoring this. When we did have rain in the season, it was a fairly decent amount. So that probably kept those non-irrigated uh, um, crop going, which is why we haven't got a significant drop in our non-irrigated. But again, up to 4,000, we got good. We got no drop in yield. What about common scab? I mentioned at the start, this is one of the reasons why we're doing this irrigation. We want to control common scab and one of, part, one of the key focuses of the trial. This really just shows the blue lines are our common scab um, percent levels, measured again by John. Um, clearly, we can see here that the non-irrigated plot, it just shows the importance of irrigation for controlling common scab. But if we have a, a slightly saline irrigation up to 4,000 ppm, there's no significant impact. John also measured black dot and found no differences. So again, we're going all the way up to 4,000 ppm and not having an impact here either. And finally, another quality measure is skin brightness. Um, again, it's the same story. The non-irrigated plots are where the impact is, but when we look at our drip application of salinity, no, no, no impacts again. So that was a, a run through of the impacts to crops. So, in, and I will caveat that that is in our season, in this growing season, we didn't see any significant impacts to all the measures we, uh, that John made. Let's have a look at soil. So soil, the, the idea of looking at soil is what, are there any long-term impacts? Yes, we got a wave of crop this year. Is there gonna be potential impact on a subsequent crop if the salt lingers around in the soil? Um, I'll caveat this, we, we're going back in February to do a final sampling. So the soil, the soil story is not fully complete yet. We're, we've budgeted in for one more visit in February to look at it in, this, in the next crop. So I mentioned at the start, salt damages soil structure. How can we look at that? Well, we did some compaction measures. Um, interestingly, I've just put the free, the free salinity tabs up on here, uh, lines up on here. What did we find? Well, with compaction at depth, this is below 35 centimeters, there was a slight increase in, in levels of compaction in the higher salinity plots, possibly because salts over time are flushing down and damaging structure there. We did this at the end of the growing season. However, we've been reliably informed by David that he subsoiled this field, field afterwards, which goes down to 40 centimetres. So that might knock, knock that problem on the head, if you will. Next up, infiltration rates. Gr generally speaking, we found higher infilt uh, lower infiltration rates in higher the higher salinity plots, which might in, 
uh, indicate a slight structural damage, but this was measured in the beds at the end of the season. So until we go back in February, we're not going to know if that's an actual legacy effect. And lastly, we used a, a, a new measure for us, which is looking at soil respiration in fields. So the more biological activity in the soil, the more respiration, the more CO2 is released. Um, no significant results across it. Um, but what was interesting, if you look at it, there was a slight, um, if you compared overhead to, to the lowest salinity setting, that's the same level of salinity, it's just different application method. There was a slight, you know, something else is going on in there. It's important to stress this is just a very, you could almost say a crude measure of soil biology because, because we're just measuring how much respiration, how much breathing is going on in there. We don't know what, what that is. And that's one of the things the university are looking to do next with, with partners is to actually get a detailed breakdown of what, how have we changed the biology in these soils. Okay, that's the crops, that's the soils. Let's look at system economics. Um, this is thanks to, to Andrew and David who, who came up with some, some nice figures for us. How does it compare doing this drip application? Well, in this part of the world where we have big infrastructure in terms of reservoirs for water application, drip irrigation's coming in at around 600 pound an acre. The overhead equivalent in this part of the world, I must say, is, is about 160, acre, 160 pounds per acre for a 20 mil application. Now over the season, we applied roughly or just over 80 mil, which equates to roughly the same um costs uh comparing drip to overhead so the trial costs were rough would have equated to roughly the same however in a drier year the drip would have probably had more benefits in terms of economic gains and we know with the drip we can go up to this 4000 ppm salinity so we could end up using utilizing newer water sources on the farm okay i'll just wrap up summary we we did drip irrigation up to 4,000 ppm. That's four times more than what we normally would do on this farm. Um, no yield or quality compromises in our crop. But we will flag that if we did have a, some decent rainfall in the summer. There's potentially, there was potentially some soil structure damage right at the end of the measurement. However, I don't think we're, we can safely say what the long-term damage is or if there is any until I go back in spring and look at this level of salts and the level of structural damage and the microbial uh, respiration in the next crop, see if it's still there. And finally, the costs roughly amounted to the same when we were compared overhead to drip. But we know we can get away with doing this uh, salinity increase in our drip uh, irrigation. Um, Potentially that could lead to, to those growers in the area without water storage. Potentially they could start utilizing these direct from drains uh, resources. Next time we'd love to go a bit higher, a bit spicier, if you will. So I would like to end there and just say thank you all very much for listening. And I'd like to thank all of our partners in this. Um, Soil Moisture Sense, GH Hoyles, um, Andrew Hausman, um, Hausman Agriculture, Richard Austin Agriculture and John Keir, AHDB Potatoes and particularly Anne and Neen Potatoes, Neen Growers, and also our funders, Innovative Farmers. That's quite a lot of people to thank. And uh, some of it was supported by our Interreg project as well. Um, so yeah, if you've got any questions, there's my Twitter, there's my email as well, but uh, there's, a, there's time now for uh, us to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ian. That's a really clear summary. Um, now, let's tackle the questions. Um, what was the source for the reservoir water? Okay, um, thanks, yeah, uh, so for our reservoir, so um, David mentioned it uh, briefly in the video. So what normally happens is in times of, of higher rainfall and lower salinity in those drainage ditches, that water can be pumped into the irrigation reservoir. So the idea with the irrigation reservoirs is keeping them full in times when that water is plentiful. Um, so that's where that's coming from originally. Um, but that wouldn't have been pumped. There's a uh, there's a sensor on the pump so that if it goes above a certain salinity in that drainage water, and I think this is, um, people might correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, several people use this sort of method. If the drainage water gets too salty, they're not going to put it in the irrigation reservoir. What we're trying to see is maybe we could go a little bit up, but again, nowhere near seawater. Yes, I believe that... Um... David Hoyles and others in the area who have reservoirs need to monitor what's in their drains pretty carefully from now onwards, because 
they can't be sure in advance just when the best water will be. That's yeah. Um, that's I mean it. It moves around throughout the year as well. Um, I, I'd just like to add as well. Can I add a comment on the? Um, it's just had a reminder. All of the crop metrics um, were had five times replicates, so they were they were robustly statistically analysed. If any questions come up on that front, <laughs> thank you. Now, um, if you didn't have drip irrigation, how saline do you think you could go with um, overhead irrigation? Oh, that's a good question. Because um, we didn't quite, we, we, yeah, we didn't do the whole spectrum of, of salinity on our overhead. The danger with overhead, and this is what why we went for the drip option, is that scorch. So if you're applying it, and you're going to get scorch problems, we haven't, yeah, we haven't done any trials um going that far and and i work with some partners across um europe who are doing saline um, irrigation of different crops but they're all applying with drip so i've got a yeah i won't be able to answer that one so much but um there might be something out there yes i think there's a lot to be gained by growers talking to each other in this area Absolutely. um and in fact, we benefited uh, in this project from uh, a grower with experience being prepared to share that experience with us. We were going to use lower rates of salinity, but we're told that you could go to 4,000 and, and we did. Um, now, um, here is somebody asking you to um, extrapolate when you use greater amounts of saline irrigation in drier years, do you think the effects on the crop would be significant? Okay, yes, that's what we, so I, I, I would, we have to be, bear in mind our trial is one year and like I said, there were elements of, of a decent amount of rain at times when it happened. Um, yeah, so the whole reason in our part of the world, we might, well, we want to explore this is because if you read any of the books that tell you about crop salt tolerances, if you look, if you drill down at the data, a lot of the original data has come from trials in California or Israel or Australia, um, where we, they don't have a flushing. So they're very worried about salts accumulating in the soil because they eventually there's a, there's a, there's a, um, the evaporation uh, potential is a lot more. So, so salts don't, travel down however in our climate we get a lot more well in most years we get a lot more rainfall particularly in winter so we can flush it down so in a dry year yeah I, I, again we, we're just starting to explore this so in a dry year if we would have done more saline, saline irrigation in the summer i guess we'd pick that up in spring if there are any salts uh still lingering around which i'm going to pick up for this trial in february so it's a very good question but we've we're in our infancy on this one, on, on exploring that. Right, thank you. Um, if a grower was planning to use slightly saline water in rotation, because of course not all the crops in the rotation will need irrigation, um, would it be prudent to plan for applications of gypsum ahead of or after that irrigation season? Okay, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so uh, gypsum is a uh, we, we might several of us might be aware it's a, it's been used before to if you get a saline flood uh, application of gypsum the, the calcium level in the gypsum replaces the sodium so it kind of helps flush those salts out. Could you apply it in a rotation if you're losing using slightly saline water? I think the whole the whole reason we're going slightly saline is that we're never going to get to a level where we've got. Uh, salt water a proper contamination problem if we've got a proper contamination problem of salts that's when you might flood in uh bring bring in the gypsum um i yeah i, I think if if you're it, gypsum i would say is more of a remediation problem if you oh no we've got a salt problem let's get the gypsum on if we're actually putting salt on ourselves uh um we shouldn't really be putting on our levels then we have to then gypsum i would i would i would imagine Right, so we we'll leave the gypsum for when there's flooding. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is, it, it could be a way of, I mean, I'll go back in, in February, we'll take some soil sam samples, but I think it. I think the salts might have dropped by then. They were pretty low when we last took them, so I don't think there would be a need for gypsum in a trial like this. Right, thank you. Now, um, 
we know that different varieties of potato vary for all other characteristics and, and expect they do for tolerance to salinity. Can you give us any advice on varieties? So for varieties, I would say um, I wouldn't be, I'm not the, a, a potato agronomist, but I would say that the trials, there's been a lot of trials coming out of a, a an outfit, an outfit, a, a research and of, of an outreach group in the Netherlands called Salt Farm Texel. So, if anybody wants to look at their work, they've done a lot of um, screening of varieties with saline irrigation. And I think I, I wouldn't. I'm afraid I don't know the varieties off the top of my head, but they've run about eight or twelve potato varieties at, at different levels of salinity, higher than even what we've gone here. However, they're on a very sandy soil, so you get a lot more flushing. So that's a bit of work there that they've done screening, basically, of different varieties. So Salt Farm Texel, if you look for what they've done, that would be the best place to go to for that. Good, thank you. Now, um, there's a question on the costs here. Checking the cost, is it £400 per hectare for 20 millimetres using overhead irrigation? So Where did I will... Where did that figure come from? That figure, so... Um, I I wasn't the uh, so that was a discussion with both Andrew and um, and David. So it came yeah four hundred pounds per hectare for twenty mil was and I wonder if Andrew has been listening he might be able to comment on this one if we open it to discussion. I wonder, Those are the values. Back a few um back a few slides. Yeah, let's go for the, to, to the um to show oh, the figures again. Well, I don't think I'm in control of the, uh, but let's see if I can get it back. Oh, yes, I'm back in control. Right. OK, so the, the figures we got from um, from Andrew are about, or was from Andrew and David, was, uh, this 160 is per it. acre is 400 per hectare, isn't it? For 20 mil overhead. We have a higher, this part of the world is higher in terms of, um, pounds per acre in terms of, of, of water because of the infrastructure involved. Um, so that's factoring all of that in. Yes, I remember um, David Hoyles made some points about that, that because they're so far below sea level that they have to have shallow reservoirs, which are clearly more expensive, they take up more land. Um, so costs here are rather different from those in other areas. Um, yes, I think um, for more detail on costs, it would be necessary to contact um, uh, Andrew Hausman. Uh, he's um, the one who's done the calculations. Now, another question, if um, we were dealing with very salty land, uh, after flooding, can you give advice on crops that would be suitable, that would give a profit even in such conditions and perhaps help to clean the salt out of those fields? Yes. OK, yeah. So a, a, a flood, a saline flood is a very different uh, ball game because it's it's a real dose and you've got real structural damage. And, um, We've done a lot of sampling with areas that had been flooded before, um, certainly the 2013 floods. So after a, 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 a saline flood from the sea, um, you've got really damaged structure because you've got a, a lot of salt going on. Um, but you've also had probably an element of water logging as well. So you, the key thing there is, is real structural damage. It's not a very appetizing soil for plant or biological life as it stands. So. This goes back to one of the early questions, the um, the, the uh, gypsum question. So gypsum here is where something like gypsum will potentially or could have a real impact. So gypsum come if you can apply gypsum, uh, you um, you might start getting a salt removal provided there's good drainage. But in terms of crops, um, we're assuming well a sea flood is a, is a real high saline dose. So the, I guess there's two there's probably three avenues you could go down. Uh, the first avenue is um, 
uh, uh, just recovery land straight away. So you can start putting it back into viable production. So you might look at yeah, your gypsum applications or playing about to improve that soil structure to get the flushing going. So stuff like uh, you could put in cover crops that will root down and get some drainage going. The second option is to grow crops that we know have an existing market that are salt tolerant. So sugar beet would be a classic example, provided the soil structures there. Um, something like barley could withstand quite a bit of salinity. Um, grazing the field would grass would, would would survive in a bit of salinity. So at least here we're in a controlled area where we at least we know what to do with those crops and where they could go. You could take it a stage further, which I find, which could be interesting. And I'd be very interested to hear if anyone's playing about with the more uh, salt loving uh, um, crops. And, and, and we had a chat earlier, Anne, about um, um, quinoa being one of them. That's very salt tolerant. Um, but also you've got halophytes, stuff like samphire. Now that, that's, that will love the salts and it would, and something like that would take up salts. But, uh, yeah, it's it's selling it to an to a mar an existing market or having the actual infrastructure to do these novel crops is a different question. So you've got kind of I'd say three options: recover your soil as quick as possible, and then go back to normal cropping. Start uh, cropping stuff that's a bit more salt tolerant, but there is an existing market for, but it might not be your normal stuff. So you might be accepting a um, financial risk or, or loss there. Or the third option is to, to, to really explore these uh, lesser explored crops that are real salt tolerant, the halophytes. Thank you. So we don't have to give up when land is flooded. There's a lot that can be done. Um, now, there, there are some more points here on the economics. Somebody said, I assume the cost does include a capital cost and not just annual running costs. And indeed, it does. Um, now, Andrew Hausman points out that David Hoyle's costs were £400 per hectare for overhead, including all underground main and loss of earnings on land set aside for the reservoir and equipment. But as David Hoyle's pointed out, those costs do depend a lot on the area over which um, the irrigation is used. So an element of investment can be spread over many hectares or just a few and that will vary a great deal with the um, farm concerned. Now um, an earlier question was could this work be used to expand the availability of water for irrigation in other parts of the country on tidal rivers such as the Hay, the Tay, the Humber, or the Severn. The very Tamar as well, I know, has similar problems. Yeah, very good question. I mean, if we, uh, if you look historically, I mean, if um, certainly where we are, so we're in Lincolnshire, so we've got we're not that far from the Trent, which then goes into the Humber. So. Historically, um, people might be aware of, of, of warping, where you'd let a bit of the uh, of the of the tidal river in onto your land with a nice rich sediment deposition going with it, and that was a, a fertility booster, if you will. Now you can actually see as you go up the Trent and into the Humber, where it was, where was it, where was it was where it was employed, you know, going up. But as you hit get closer and closer to the sea, you'll see where it was. It was less um, prevalent and. And I guess there's a level in towards the sea where the salts would be too high and you'd probably be doing more damage than you would be doing good. However, there's um, uh, so I guess it would depend on how far up the river you are, and how close to the coast you are. You do have the benefit, you might say, in rivers of added uh, sediment and potential uh, nutrition there depending on what what how you're getting the water you're skimming it from the top or from the bottom however you've also got to bear in mind what else is being brought downstream are you introducing anything else into that soil ecosystem um but yeah uh, yeah it's it's yeah it's it, i would say um depends how close to the coast really but you've got historic evidence of of these kind of warping stuff mm, so Active we need practices. to be open to the possibilities and people 
people from those areas can also follow your research to learn just how far they can go. Yes, and it'd be worth just pointing out there's a, um, a current RSPB project on uh, north side of the Humber where they're um, letting in water from the Humber onto onto farmland for a very uh, for different duration periods. So that's coming in with a bit of salts, but also a bit of sediment as well. So we're not we're not right at the coast, um, and that's an ongoing project. So something that people could keep tabs on or um, and keep keep an eye on. Good, thank you. Um, now you mentioned sediment. Someone here is asking how much difference does soil type and specifically organic matter percentage um, have on the effect of salinity. Could the results have been different with a, another soil type or location? Very good question. Thanks, Anne. Yes, that's uh, spot on. It would be different if we were to do uh, anywhere else. Um, so we use a silt loam soil, very silty. Um, um, the more clay you have in a soil, the more the salt would stick around um, and potentially the more structural damage you would have because you would get more dispersion as well. So a clay soil, we would expect these results to, I mean, it'd be nice if we had to say, but, but a clay soil, again, would we be uh, having uh, potato production and irrigation on a clay soil? So clay soil would probably be the most damaged. A sandy soil, on the other hand, has a lot of drainage and a lot of uh, leaching of those salts. And so if you look at the Dutch uh, who have been trialing a lot of doing these variety screenings, they want a very sandy soil. So the sandier the soil, probably the more you could get away with this. The other part of the question was on organic matter. Now, organic matter might have two impacts um, here. One is, in, in fact, in, by building and helping build a structure. So if there is any soil structural damage from salt dispersion, having more organic matter in there might help um, help buffer that. Um, it could also, it, by increasing the kind of cation exchange capacity of the soil, the amount of nutrients that the soil could hold or salts that the soil could hold, it could also offer a bit of buffering there in terms of our salt um, impact. So I would imagine more organic matter, um, you might get away, uh, you could potentially do, do a bit more as well because you have structural benefits and, uh, and different aspects in terms of nutrient cycling. We're mm. sort of midway because we're the silts. We're sort of midway between. So the sands would probably get away with potentially more irrigation. We'll have to look and see. Hopefully that's an, the next part of the work. Clays, maybe not so much. Could I ask you to spell that out a bit more, Ian? If you had um, a sandy soil, a sandy clay loam and a silt yep. soil, how would the same level of a fairly high salinity do in those three? Um, so I think the least, I'm talking from a soil perspective, so soil damage, the least damage would be on the sandy soil. Then I wouldn't know, but so sandy clay loam, you've got more of a clay fraction. So you've got more, and the clay is really where the, the salts are going to stick to and possibly cause the damage. So you'll have more of a clay fraction in a sandy clay loam. Again, it all depends on the, the in situ structure of that soil. If it's If it's nice and free draining, you'll get salt. Salt always want to go, to get, go down. So a better structured soil would go down. So sandy soil would probably come off the best. I wouldn't know where which one's best out of the silt loam or the sandy clay loam. My money would be on the silt loam, but I wouldn't like to comment until we've done, we've had a look in those soils. Right, thank you. Um, now, there is a comment here from Andrew Hausman, who was involved in, with this work, um, who thinks it would they could explore mixing half stored water and half ditch water. If it's not possible to store as much as might be desired for the season, then it shouldn't be too expensive to, to make that combination. Uh, using, well, in our work in spot farms, we've seen at Spot North on silty land, that much less water was needed using drip irrigation than overhead. Um, and if people are starting to use drip water, um, drip irrigation, where there's a shortage of water, then this might open up uh, places that couldn't previously have been irrigated. 
so a combination of drip and stored and drain water. Right, we're at the end of the questions then. Thank you, Ian. Um, Thanks. But from the point of view of AHDB and coordinating this Innovative Farmers Field Lab, there are several people who went out of their way to enable this trial. Um, Ian, certainly. But also, we're particularly grateful to the host, David Hoyle. Um, it's, um, it's always um, putting your head on the block when you offer to be a host for any trial. And it, it's great that he was willing to do this. Also, Mark Taylor of Neem Growers for his push to make this all happen. Andrew Hausman for fitting it in when he was very busy with his um, commercial work at that period. Um, Tim Blythe for interesting measuring equipment and um, John Keir for his thoroughness in um, taking and measuring all the samples. The Results structure won't be complete until the end of March next year, but shortly afterwards we expect a final report from Dr. Gold, which will be available on the websites of both AHDB and Innovative Farmers. I'd like to say thanks to Anne as well. Thank you for coordinating us as well. <laughs> Very I good. Yeah. I would say it's it's been a it's a really enjoyable thing to be part to be a researcher to be part of these kind of trials with with all the people from different aspects of industry. I've really enjoyed it. So, yeah. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks.